This is the Argument Energy Podcast, episode 36. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Kevin Delaplante, and this is the Argument Energy Podcast. On this episode, I'm continuing the series I started in episode 34 that looks at different theories of the causes of social polarization why there's so much animosity and mistrust between different cultural and political groups, and why things seem to be getting worse. I've got some Argument Ninja announcements to make first, and then our list of topics for this episode is going to include a discussion of the general problem, what it means to understand a complex social phenomenon like polarization, and then we're going to take a close look at the work of two social scientists, Karen Stenner and Eric Kaufman and their views on the causes of social polarization. Karen Stenner is famous for her work on the authoritarian personality type, and Kaufman has made headlines recently with his new book, White Shift, that talks about the political impacts of immigration on white majority countries. And as we'll see, there's some interesting overlap between Jonathan Haidt's views and Karen Stenner's views, and again between Stenner and Kaufman. But before we get to all that, I want to give an update on Argument Ninja developments. As most of my listeners will know, for several years I've been running a video tutorial website at criticalthinkeracademy.com where, in the past, people could purchase access to video tutorial courses or sign up for a site-wide subscription that gives access to all the content on the site. I've also been using Patreon for several years to accept monthly subscription payments, and those patrons would then be given access to the content at the Critical Thinker Academy. Now, I've talked in the past about how not great this setup is and how much better it would be to have all of my content and all of my audiences consolidated under one roof. So my plan was to develop a new site to host all of this content and make it a subdomain of my personal hub site at kevindelaplante.com. The idea was that going forward, you wouldn't have to sign up at the Critical Thinker Academy to access my tutorials and you wouldn't need a recurring subscription with Patreon to be a recurring supporter. You could subscribe right at kevindelaplante.com and access the content there. And this new site is where I would be developing my new content. So one of my goals, really, was to make both my Patreon account and the Critical Thinker Academy site obsolete. Well, I can announce that I've developed a new site, which is linked off of kevindelaplante.com, which has all the video courses that I've been hosting at the Critical Thinker Academy as well as the new videos I did this past year on tribalism and polarization. I'm calling this new site the Argument Ninja Dojo, and I've begun the process of migrating my supporters from these other platforms over to the new platform. I've sent a couple of emails to my Patreon supporters with special coupon links so they can register at the dojo for the same pledge rate that they've chosen on Patreon, and I would say that probably half of you have made the jump so far. Not everyone gets these emails or opens them, so it'll take a while to give everyone an opportunity. I've also emailed my registered students at the Critical Thinker Academy, and some of these have migrated over as well. In both cases, if you've made the switch, you can now cancel your subscriptions on Patreon or at the Academy site. Now, I'm going to include those coupon links in the show notes for this podcast episode. So if you're listening to this now, even if you've never supported me before, you can get access to these discounted subscriptions. And another reason why you might want to consider this is that the Argument Ninja Dojo includes quite a bit more than just the video tutorials. I've also begun the process of hosting text versions of all the video content and hosting text versions of all the podcast content. This is already adding up to almost 100,000 words, and there's still a lot to add. So what we really have at the Dojo are two libraries a video library, and what I'm calling an article library. Now, the dojo is also where I'm working on new courses, what I'm calling the Argument Ninja training program courses. These will have a video component and a text component, and they'll reflect my most recent thinking about the nature of critical thinking and how to build skills in reasoning, in acquiring knowledge, in communication, and in persuasion. But right now, you can access the video library and the text library, and you can get access to a private Argument Ninja Dojo Facebook group by signing up over at kevindelaplante.com. You should use the coupon links in the podcast episode description to do that. They'll take you to a page that has all the details. 
Now, on a related point, over the past month or so, I have revised some of my plans for the Critical Thinker Academy and my Patreon account. Let me explain. The new Argument Ninja Dojo is a subscription-only site. You can't purchase access to individual courses. But I do know that there's still interest in this. So what I've decided to do is leave the Critical Thinker Academy site up, but remove the subscription option. So you can purchase access to video courses on a low per course basis, or you can purchase a site-wide bundle, and these will all be one-time fees. But you won't get access to the article library or the new courses I'm developing. These will only be available with a subscription at the Dojo site. Now it appears that I also have a reason to hold on to my Patreon account, at least for some supporters. The issue here is that the platform I'm using for my new site doesn't yet accept PayPal for recurring subscriptions, but Patreon does. And this is an issue for some people because of where they live. There are surcharges that they may be required to pay with a credit card, but not with PayPal. So for some, this is a deal breaker when it comes to recurring subscriptions. So for those of you who find yourself in this situation, I say, hold on to your Patreon subscription. I'm not going to take down my Patreon page until there's a good option for you. Contact me and I'll send you a link to sign up on the new platform for free. We'll manage it this way until the PayPal issue is resolved from my end. Okay, I think that's it for announcements. Let's return now to the main topic of this podcast episode, which is about the challenges of understanding the root causes of complex phenomena like social polarization. And like I said, polarization is an important issue on its own, but for me, it's also relevant from a straight critical thinking standpoint. Because one of the consequences of excessive polarization is that, as I've been arguing for a while, it impairs our critical thinking faculties. When we identify strongly with a partisan, political, or ideological worldview, our perceptions of the world are distorted, our judgment is impaired, and we don't reason as well as we could otherwise. Under these conditions, our tribal identities structure our attitudes and behaviors in ways that make it harder for us to say that we're really thinking for ourselves. One could say that they undermine our intellectual autonomy. Now, I'm not going to revisit all of this here because my focus in this series on polarization is actually different. I'm interested in the phenomenon of polarization and theories about the causes of polarization as a case study in critical thinking about complex social phenomena more broadly. So yes, I want to learn about this specific phenomenon because it's terribly important, but I'm also interested in the broader methodological issue of how we should even approach trying to understand social phenomena like this. What general lessons can we learn about the challenges of understanding human behavior on this scale? What biases do scientists and researchers from different disciplines bring when they turn their attention to these kinds of issues? What principles can we discover that would be helpful for avoiding errors or improving the quality of our thinking on topics like this? These critical thinking questions are the real focus of this series. Now, I don't want to repeat everything we talked about in episode 34, but I think we do need a bit of review to set the context for what I want to talk about this episode and in subsequent episodes. In episode 34, we looked at several examples of what I called depolarization initiatives. These are organized attempts to intervene in society and reduce the level of polarization between different social groups. And what I focused on there were the assumptions that these programs were making about the causes of polarization. If this is your prescription to help solve the problem, what's your diagnosis of the root causes of the problem? So in episode 34, I looked at the Better Angels organization, I looked at allsides.com, and I looked at Open Mind and I tried to reconstruct the theoretical assumptions that these different organizations were working with. And what I concluded was that there's often a mismatch between the scale of the intervention that is prescribed by these depolarization initiatives and the scale of the diagnosis of the problem when you look a little harder. With these organizations, the interventions tended to focus on changing individuals, like, for example, educating us about how our tribal psychology works teaching us better listening and communication skills, changing our media consumption habits, and so on. Social change is supposed to happen from the bottom up, by individuals influencing the people in the groups they interact with through one-on-one -on -one interactions, 
and the effects are supposed to spread outward in this way. But even a moderately sophisticated look at the root causes of social polarization shows that it's what I called a multifactorial phenomenon, meaning that there are multiple causal factors involved that often interact, and it's a multiscalar phenomenon, meaning that these different causal factors often operate at very different spatial and temporal scales. A good example of this mismatch can be seen with Jonathan Haidt's Open Mind platform, which is an online training tool that is designed to depolarize individuals and give them tools for depolarizing communities. This intervention strategy focuses on changing individuals. But Haidt's own analysis of the causes of polarization is multifactorial and multiscalar. He talks about universal psychological factors, recent trends in media consumption patterns, trends in the organization of national politics, changing media technologies, specific demographic changes in the sorting of American culture and political groups over the past 50 years, anxieties about immigration, and the failures of neoliberalism and globalization to bring improvements in material well-being to many populations around the world. And the question that I raised at the end of that episode was a simple one. If all of these different high-level social factors are involved in explaining the rise of polarization in recent years, why should we be optimistic that depolarization initiatives that target individuals and bottom-up mechanisms of social change are going to have any real impact on the problem? There's a mismatch between the diagnosis and the prescription. So that's the recap. Now, in this episode, I want to move the ball down the field a little further in terms of clarifying the nature of the critical thinking challenge. I'm going to lay out a simple conceptual model of the challenge, a visual picture of the epistemological situation that we're facing that I think is helpful. And then I want to illustrate the model by looking closer at four different approaches to polarization that I haven't talked about yet. We'll do two this episode and two the next episode. First, as I said, I'm going to talk about Karen Stenner's influential work in political psychology on what is called the authoritarian dynamic. Jonathan Haidt has worked closely with Stenner recently. She's had a big influence on his thinking. Second, I'm going to talk about Eric Kaufman's work on political demographics and the causes of social conflict and the position he articulates in his most recent book, which is titled White Shift. And there are interesting overlaps between Stenner and Kaufman that I'm going to bring out. Now, I think this is more than enough for one episode. So in the next episode, I'm going to move a little bit away from empirically oriented political science and look at Francis Fukuyama's latest book about the origins of identity politics and identity-based conflict. He's a political scientist, but he comes at this from a more historical and humanistic position. But still, there are interesting areas of overlap with Stenner and Kaufman. Now, by comparing these three approaches, I'm trying to illustrate a general point about how our disciplinary perspectives, whether it be psychology, history, political science, social science, whatever, how these influence what we pay attention to when we study a complex social phenomenon like polarization, and consequently, the kinds of theories that researchers are motivated to develop. And to make this point more vividly, next episode, I'm going to close with a fourth example a fourth approach to understanding the causes of polarization, which is very different from the previous three. I'm going to talk about what Dan Kahan has called antagonistic memes and his work on the role they play in turning non-political, empirical, or scientific issues into partisan political issues. So all of this should be interesting on its own. These four different approaches to understanding polarization are each really fascinating and illuminating in their own way, as we'll see. But the broader methodological issues that I'm trying to highlight only emerge when you compare different approaches like these, when you become sensitized to the variety of approaches to understanding human psychology and human conflict, and ask yourself, what's really going on here? What does all this diversity tell us about the nature of the phenomena that we're trying to understand? And crucially, what does it tell us about the errors that we might be prone to make and how we might avoid those errors? That's the bigger set of questions that I'm interested in. Okay, I'm going to start by sketching a conceptual model of the epistemological challenge that we face when we try to understand complex social phenomena like this. This model is familiar from discussions I've had on the podcast about argument matrices. 
and how the kind of knowledge that supports genuine critical thinking is actually structured. But I'm going to add a second layer to it that's more specific to the kind of phenomena that we're trying to understand here. So we start with a topic or an issue, like what is the cause of social polarization, or how is the authority of the state justified, or when is abortion morally right or wrong, whatever. That's your root claim, or your root issue. Then you start building out arguments that entail a particular position on that issue. The conclusion of these arguments points back to the root issue. You can think of this as an argument mapping exercise. Now those arguments will have premises, and you can always ask, why should I accept those premises? That's asking for another argument, a level two argument, to justify the premises of the level one argument. And you can imagine going deeper and deeper until you can't go any further. The chain of justification bottoms out somewhere. This property of moving farther down the chain of justification relative to a particular root claim, I call this argumentative depth. And you can also imagine the best natural objections to these arguments, which attempt to challenge either the truth of a premise or the strength of the reasoning. If you really understand an issue well, then you'll also be familiar with the best objections and the best replies to these objections, and so forth. Now, another very important feature of arguments surrounding a complex issue is that you have distinct lines of argumentation which can be clustered into different intellectual traditions or theoretical approaches to the issue. Just to give an example, if the subject is the ethics of war, and the question is when, if ever, war is morally justified, one way to categorize thinking about this issue is to group arguments into one of three camps. A pacifism camp, a just war theory camp, and a political realism camp. How do they differ? Well, basically, pacifists don't think wars are ever morally justified. Just war theorists believe that some wars are morally justifiable, some wars are not, and there are general moral principles that can tell you which is which. And political realists believe that moral principles don't really bear on the question of the justification of war. They think that it's just not a domain where traditional moral arguments can be meaningfully applied. So, this categorization gives us three distinct intellectual traditions that branch off from the root question, which is, when, if ever, war is morally justified. Now, if you were trying to map all of this out, you'd end up drawing a tree structure of some kind. If you imagine a literal tree planted in the ground, then the root issue is the base of the trunk, and the main branches that come off the root represent distinct lines of argumentation that themselves branch out into distinct arguments, sub-arguments, supporting arguments, objections, replies, and so on. The tree limbs become increasingly bushy the farther out you go. Now, another property of these kinds of argument trees, or argument matrices, is argumentative breadth. This is a measure of how many distinct lines of argumentation are captured in the representation. How many branches there are for any given level of argumentative depth. An argument matrix with only one main branch and a couple of sub-branches is less broad than a matrix with two or three or four main branches. These have, respectively, greater argumentative breadth. Visually, the tree has more lower-level branches and is bushier. So thinking of our ethics of war matrix, you can compare people's understanding of the issue by comparing the argument matrices that they're familiar with, that they're able to conceptually navigate with respect to the issue. If someone is only familiar with just war arguments, for example, their understanding is narrower than someone who is familiar with all three traditions of thinking about the ethics of war. And if someone can only give a level one explanation of an argument, but isn't able to anticipate and respond to the most natural objections to a given line of argument, then we can say that their understanding is not as deep as someone who is better able to do this. Now, here's an important question that we need to ask ourselves. With respect to any particular issue that we care about, think we understand something about, how confident should we be in the adequacy or the completeness of our knowledge? We all know situations when someone starts off learning a new subject, and early on they become very confident they've really got their heads around it, because they've learned something that many other people don't know. But you know from your own experience that that confidence is misplaced. 
because these people don't yet know what they don't know. They're overconfident about the extent of their knowledge. They're seeing a part of the tree, but that's all they see, and they're mistaking the part for the whole. The analogy is like someone straddling one of the main branches of a tree, and they're looking outward toward the end of that branch, and that's all they see. They don't see that this trunk may have three or four other main branches, and that there are people sitting on those branches looking outward as well. These are people who are familiar with different parts of the tree. And we can see that the person who sits closer to the root of the tree and sees more of the branches radiating upward and outward has a broader understanding of the issue than someone who sits farther out and sees less of the tree. But here's the question. At any given moment, how do we know where we sit on the tree? I might feel very confident that I'm seeing the whole picture. How do I know I'm not wrong about that? How do I know that I'm not seeing only part of the tree? How do I know that I'm not actually seeing only a tiny part of the tree? In other words, how do I gauge the depth and breadth of my knowledge and understanding? This is a way of framing an argument for, at the very least, caution and humility in our judgments of the completeness of our own understanding. And maybe even an argument for a more radical skepticism, but I don't think we're completely without guidance. Our goal can't be to eliminate all uncertainty. That's not possible. Our goal should be to get better at calibrating our degree of confidence and the depth and breadth of our knowledge so it more accurately reflects our true position within the argument matrix, relative to others and relative to the complete matrix that reflects the totality of argumentative discourse surrounding the issue. So if I only know a little, I want to feel subjectively that I only know a little. If I only know a little but I feel like I know a lot, I'm overconfident. That's a calibration error. Similarly, if I know a lot, or at least more than other people, I want my subjective feelings of confidence to track reality as much as possible. It is possible to underestimate our knowledge, too. Imposter syndrome is a real experience for many people, even experts. But how do we get the calibration right? There's no simple answer to this, but some contexts are easier to judge than others. It really does depend on the type of phenomena we're trying to understand, the scope of the knowledge claims we're making, and our background and experience relative to these knowledge claims and this domain. For example, if I'm a beginning physics student and I'm just learning about the physics of semiconductors, it's entirely reasonable to think that my physics professor, who is a leading expert in semiconductor physics, and who is an editor of the leading journal on semiconductor physics, has access to a much larger chunk of the argument matrix surrounding the physics of semiconductors. And it's entirely reasonable for that professor to think the same. Now here the knowledge domain is fairly circumscribed, and the professional experience of this physics professor is likely to put them in a position where they're exposed to a fairly comprehensive array of arguments on the topic. So this physics professor is justified in believing not only that they know more than me, but that they have an understanding of the topic that is both deep and broad and comprehensive, that they're seeing a good chunk of the whole. Not everything, but certainly enough to justify thinking of themselves as a genuine authority on the topic. They would be justifiably surprised, for example, to discover that there's a whole tradition of theorizing about semiconductors that they were not aware of. Now, what I want to suggest is that we have a very different situation going on when we're reasoning about complex social phenomena like polarization. And that difference makes it more likely that even legitimate experts within their own domains will not be aware of the larger intellectual picture, the larger universe of discourse on the subject. And as a consequence, they're likely to be overconfident about the scope and depth of their knowledge on these kinds of topics. This is because of two things. One, complex social phenomena are multifactorial and multiscalar. There are different types of causal processes operating and interacting across different temporal and spatial scales that are responsible for the phenomena that we observe. And two, traditional academic disciplines are bounded, are circumscribed, in ways that virtually ensure that if we're dealing with complex social phenomena of this sort, they're only capturing a part of the full story. Their attention is necessarily going to be focused on one branch, or a set of nearby branches on what could be a very large and bushy tree.
Now, this is not to say that we can't learn a great deal about the phenomenon in question from scholars who study different branches of the tree. There are predictive patterns everywhere, and uncovering those patterns is valuable. That's what disciplinary research is good at. The examples that we'll look at in this episode testify to that. But it is to say that there will likely be patterns that will be missed, because they deal with variables and interactions that span different branches of the tree. And there are far fewer people doing this kind of interdisciplinary research looking for these kinds of patterns. That's just the nature of disciplinary research, how researchers are educated, and how the professional structure of academia is tied to and reinforces these disciplinary boundaries. So that's my conceptual model of the epistemological challenge that we're facing, and I want you to keep this in mind as we go forward. So, with this picture in mind, let's move on and look at our first researcher, Karen Stenner, what she has to say about the causes of polarization. Here's a bit of an intro. Uh, Karen Stenner is an Australian political psychologist and behavioral economist. So basically, she studies human behavior and factors that influence attitudes and behavior in a political context. She used to be a professor at Duke and at Princeton, but she since left academia actually and now works in the private sector as a researcher and consultant. Now, Stenner's reputation got a boost a few years ago when Jonathan Haidt proclaimed in a blog post in 2016 that the best resource for understanding the rise of Donald Trump and his popular support is Karen Stenner's treatment of authoritarianism in a book she published back in 2005 titled The Authoritarian Dynamic. One can read that book, which is now almost 20 years old, as predicting the global rise of authoritarian political figures and far-right politics that we've seen over the past 10 years. So, what's the story that she tells? What is the authoritarian dynamic? Well, the key idea is that she's using this term, authoritarian, in a very specific way. The term, authoritarianism, is most commonly associated with a type of political ideology or a style of governance. So, you might describe a government where there's a lot of top-down restrictions on individual freedoms and state power is used to enforce government-approved social norms as an authoritarian government. But Stenner is using this term in a very different way. She's using the term authoritarian to label a psychological disposition, a personality trait that people may have in varying degrees. So we can study the authoritarian personality trait much as we study other personality traits. Today, the most common personality traits that are taken seriously by academic researchers are the so-called Big Five dimensions of personality. You answer a battery of survey questions and you see where you fall along the five different dimensions of openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. So, for example, openness is a measure of how open you are to new experiences. If you have an opportunity to go to a new foreign restaurant when it opens up, or listen to a new kind of music, Are you more likely to pursue those opportunities or are you more likely to avoid them and prefer what's more familiar to you? In general, are you more inventive and curious or are you more traditional and cautious? To give another example, conscientiousness is a measure of how self-disciplined you are, how likely you are to complete tasks and fulfill goals that are set for you or that you set for yourself. In general, are you more efficient and organized or are you more easygoing and careless? So, What Stenner wanted to do in her work in political psychology is develop a theory to explain patterns in a particular type of social phenomena by showing how these patterns can be seen as a consequence of, or a manifestation of, a personality trait that happens to be possessed by a certain fraction of the population. Now, what exactly is the social phenomena that she's trying to explain? What she's trying to explain is the dynamics of intolerant attitudes and behaviors. Intolerance can be directed towards people of different races, different ethnicities, different religions, different cultures. It can be directed toward people of different gender identities, different sexual orientations. It can be directed toward people who are seen as foreigners or outsiders. And the intolerance can vary in degree, from grudging acceptance to verbal conflicts to physical conflicts, and up to the point of demanding political action that brings the power of the state to bear in the passing of laws and the use of coercive power 
as a means of pushing back against those perceived threats to the social order. We can all think of examples where particular societies or groups within societies are gripped by varying degrees of intolerance towards specific other groups. In Africa, for example, there are around 34 countries where homosexuality is illegal and 20 countries where it's legal. In five countries, homosexuality is punishable by death. As a sociological question, we can ask, what explains this variation in levels of intolerance? Intolerance also varies over time. At any given point, you can ask whether intolerant attitudes are increasing, decreasing, or stable. The recent trend in Africa is largely in the direction of increasing restrictions on LGBT rights. In Uganda, for example, the anti-gay laws had become harsher. In 2013, Uganda's parliament passed a bill that extended the sentence for adults found to have same-sex relationships from seven years in prison to life in prison. In northern Nigeria, homosexuality is punishable by death, but it's also illegal for heterosexual family members, allies, or friends of LGBT people to be supportive. Anyone who, quote, administers, witnesses, abets, or aids any form of gender non-conforming or homosexual activity could receive a 10-year jail sentence. South Africa, on the other hand, has a constitution that guarantees gay and lesbian rights and legalizes same-sex marriage. You can generalize this point. Geographically and geopolitically, you can find variation in attitudes towards specific groups, and that variation has a temporal history as well. So, if you could color code a map where shades of green represent more tolerant attitudes and shades of red represent more intolerant attitudes toward whatever, women's rights, gay rights, attitudes towards religious or other ethnic groups, attitudes about wearing tattoos, whatever, then for any given country or geopolitical region, you'd see certain patterns in the shading. And if you could survey those changes over time, you'd see changing patterns of color as some regions became more tolerant, some regions less tolerant, some staying mostly the same, and so on. Now, as a sociological phenomenon, the question to ask is, are there any general rules or principles that can help us to explain or even predict these changing patterns? Karen Stenner's book, The Authoritarian Dynamic, offers a set of general principles like this. First, she offers a description of what all these different forms of intolerance have in common. She argues that they're all responses to the presence of difference and diversity in our social environment. One sees people or behaviors or ways of life or ideas that are in various ways different from ours, and one sees a larger variety of such people or behaviors or ways of life or ideas. When you combine increases in differences and increases in diversity, you have an increase in overall social complexity. A simpler social environment is one that is either less diverse or where differences are smaller or both. So, what is the authoritarian response to increases in social complexity? The response is to feel more uncomfortable or threatened in the presence of that complexity. The authoritarian personality type is one that, all other things being equal, prefers oneness and sameness over difference and diversity, and is more likely to support social rules and even state interventions that enforce obedience and conformity to a more narrow set of social norms. Now, in her book, Stenner summarizes evidence from survey data and other sources to support the conclusion that roughly a third of the population exhibits this authoritarian personality type, and that it's substantially heritable, like many personality traits. So genetics accounts for around 50% of the variance in the population. Now, she does not claim that everyone who is disposed in this way has intolerant attitudes or supports intolerant social policies. What she claims, rather, is that authoritarian tendencies tend to lie dormant until a threat is perceived, at which point the authoritarian response can be activated. So her basic model asserts that intolerance of difference is a function of two interacting factors. The first is the authoritarian predisposition. The second is what she calls normative threat, the presence of social conditions that activate authoritarianism and exacerbate expressions of authoritarianism. This is important. On this model, it's authoritarianism in the presence of perceived normative threats that results in intolerant attitudes and behaviors. So, what is a normative threat? A normative threat is one that undermines the authoritarian's natural preference for oneness and sameness, 
and it's experienced by them as a threat to their identity. So in a racially or ethnically homogeneous society, where everyone mostly looks the same, talks the same, and shares a common historical narrative about their culture, that sense of oneness and sameness is maintained and supported. But in a diverse, multicultural society that doesn't share a single racial or ethnic identity, the things that make us an us, that makes us one and the same, are going to be different. Whatever we have in common is going to be institutional and cultural rather than racial. For example, we may share a common governance structure, live under the same laws, share the same cultural values, agree on the same social norms, and so on. So, authoritarians can live within a racially or ethnically diverse society without triggering an intolerant response. If, within all this diversity, there nevertheless exists a strong sense of common authority and shared values that can function to bind us all together, to reinforce our sense that we all belong to the same tribe. But if in our culture we don't have a sense of common authority and shared values, then you've basically defined the social conditions that will trigger an intolerant response from authoritarians. So one class of normative threats is a perceived loss of respect for or confidence in or obedience to leaders, authorities, and institutions. Another class of normative threats is a perceived loss of social consensus around shared beliefs and values. And the way these threats manifest themselves to those who have this authoritarian predisposition is as a perceived loss of racial or cultural or group identity. It's experienced as a loss of who we are, of our way of life. Now, I say perceived here because these threatening conditions can be real or merely perceived. They can reflect real changes that are going on in society, or they can be a product of biased media coverage and political manipulation, or, as is often the case, some combination of both. Anyway, this is what Karen Stenner calls the authoritarian dynamic. To sum it up, it treats the dynamics of intolerance as a function of a largely immutable but latent or dormant personality type that roughly one in three people possess that can be triggered in the presence of certain social conditions, resulting in an intolerant pushback response in those who are disposed to respond this way. Now, here are some important points to note about this trait. It's important to remember that this trait varies across the population, and it varies within the one-third who score positively in this trait. So if you're high on authoritarianism, then it takes less change to make you feel uncomfortable, and you're more likely to support coercive policies that actively resist these changes. It's also important to recognize that, in Stenner's analysis, this disposition to authoritarianism isn't treated as a negative trait. There's nothing intrinsically bad or wrong about preferring social environments that are less complex. As Stenner says, it's just another way of being human. But it is a trait that allows us to better understand the psychology of reactionary responses to progressive social changes, which many people, on both the right and the left, are justifiably worried about when they incite people to hatred and violence, which everyone wants to avoid. Now, this may all sound very grim if you're a liberal progressive who is energized by multicultural politics and thinks we need to push even harder on diversity. And to a certain extent, it is. Karen Stenner herself views her work as a treatise on the limits of liberal democracy in the face of this variation in human nature. But... If you think of yourself as a liberal progressive, you can take some comfort in knowing that the majority of people, two-thirds of the population, are either neutral on the authoritarian scale or rank negatively as non-authoritarian. If you're non-authoritarian, that means you actually have a preference for diversity and difference. You're attracted to the very same social complexity that is perceived as threatening to authoritarians. In one recent study, which included all 28 European Union countries plus the United States, 33% of white respondents were predisposed to authoritarianism, 37% were non-authoritarian, and 29% were neutral. So the project of progressive multicultural liberal democracy is always going to have a significant segment of the population that is disposed to support changes in that direction but it is also going to have to deal with a significant segment that is opposed to these changes. So you can see how this model gives us some insight into the dynamics of political and social polarization, and why Jonathan Haidt would point to Stenner's work 
as a source of insight into the rise of Trumpism in the United States and the rise of right-wing nationalism in other liberal democracies around the world. But what specifically does it say about current trends in increasing polarization and what we can do about this? Well, Stenner's view is similar to views we've heard from Jonathan Haidt, partly because her views have influenced his own. The fundamental point they both make is that a progressive politics that pushes for increasing tolerance of diversity and difference, and that is simultaneously critical of existing authority structures and dominant social norms, will inevitably trigger a backlash from the authoritarian wing of the populace. Because that's the authoritarian dynamic. And this dynamic is, as they put it, Quote, not a momentary madness, but an eternal dynamic within liberal democracies. Unquote. And this backlash will be stronger and more sustained the more that the dominant social powers label all opposition to progressive change as coming from a place of bigotry and hate and ignorance. Stenner's message is that a true democracy can't demean and dismiss the sincere preferences of a third of its citizens. It's better that they be openly expressed and seriously considered and managed within mainstream political processes rather than suppressed and driven to the extremes, to the fringes of society, because this path is far more dangerous in the long run. So what's the solution? How should we accommodate the authoritarian impulse in a diverse multicultural society? Not by pleading for tolerance of all cultures and all value systems, but rather by promoting and celebrating civic cultural norms that we can all share, and by reinforcing our commitment to shared social institutions that we all rely on. This is still a tribal strategy, but it's a big tent tribal strategy. Jonathan Haidt calls it the common humanity tribal strategy. Focus on our common humanity or national identity and on cultivating rituals and rites that affirm our membership in a common tribe and way of life. And try to stay away from the politics of identity that, for all its good intentions, has the effect of fragmenting us into increasingly smaller and more exclusionary tribes and making it harder for authoritarians to not see increasing social complexity as a threat to their identity. Now, I'm not sure how confident either Haidt or Stenner is that this strategy will be successful. I suspect they're both fairly skeptical, given the way things are going. My sense is that, for them, it's the only option on the table. So, that's Karen Stenner. And here I just want to pause for a second and note that in my argument matrix reconstruction of the argument surrounding polarization, this close relationship between Karen Stenner and Jonathan Haidt would show up as nearby branches that split off from a larger shared branch. They're close together in argument space, if you want to call it that. Now, I want to look at the work of another writer on polarization, who was also close to Stenner and Haidt on the argument tree, and that's political scientist Eric Kaufman, who studies political demography and how demographic changes in populations impact ethnic and national identities. Kaufman's most recent book is called White Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. And it's about how demographic changes in the West are driving polarization between majority white populations and ethnically mixed populations, and how he sees Western countries responding to these changes. There's a lot going on in this book, but here I just want to focus on where, on the one hand, Kaufman agrees with Karen Stenner about the root causes of polarization, and on the other, where his story is original and distinctive. The first point is that he basically signs on to the Stenner story about the authoritarian dynamic, and the distinctions she draws between conservative responses to change and authoritarian responses to change. It's tempting to think of these as the same thing, but they're not, as we'll see. Kaufman's focus is on the responses that are triggered by immigration and other demographic changes that are threatening to turn historically white majority countries into mixed race or white minority countries. Here's a quote. According to Karen Stenner, rising diversity triggers two responses, conservatism and authoritarianism. Conservatism involves maintaining continuity with the past and resisting change. If the West was diverse and became more homogeneous, as occurred in Poland or Vienna after 1939, the conservative instinct would be to wax nostalgic about past diversity. Ethnic change is the irritant, not levels of diversity. Psychological authoritarianism, by contrast, concerns the quest for order and security. Diversity, 
whether ethnic or ideological, however long its provenance, is problematic because it disrupts a sense of harmony and cohesion. Thus, for authoritarians, high levels of ethnic diversity are as much the problem as ethnic change. Even if the rate of change stays constant, high diversity levels increase discontent among those who value existential security and stability. As Western cities have been overwhelmingly white within living memory, today's ethnic shifts are triggering both conservative and authoritarian responses. Unquote. So in this passage, Kaufman is affirming a distinction that Stenner has made in several places in her writing between what she calls authoritarianism and conservatism, which I think is quite interesting and worth remembering. The conservative response is to be agitated by the perception that society is changing or changing too quickly and to be attracted to the notion of returning society to an earlier, more familiar state, whatever that was. The authoritarian response is to be agitated not by social change as such, but by a specific kind of change, namely increasing social diversity. The authoritarian impulse is to return to a society with less diversity that is more homogeneous. Now, another point of agreement between Kaufman and Senner is that he thinks that attempts to re-educate people, to turn people with a conservative and authoritarian sensibility into liberal cosmopolitans who are attracted to greater diversity and social complexity, are doomed to failure. They will only generate more resistance. Why? Because part of the sensibility is hardwired. It's built into their personality type. And part of it is also acquired from early childhood experiences, which become part of people's core identity as they mature. So for both of them, the only viable path forward in liberal democratic societies is one that acknowledges and respects these different sensibilities. Now, another area where Kaufman and Stenner agree is with respect to the root causes of the rise of right-wing populism in Western countries since 2010, including the Trump election and Brexit. Their view is that right-wing populism is primarily due to opposition to immigration in majority white populations. Now, this runs against the dominant narrative of those who defend these populist movements, which tends to focus on factors like economic insecurity, pressure on the welfare system, worries about security, or crime rates, or terrorism. Kaufman and Stenner both believe that these arguments are, to some extent, disingenuous and self-deceiving. People don't want to appear explicitly racist or xenophobic. It's much harder to say in public that I'm opposed to immigration because I'm threatened by the loss of my white majority status, or I no longer feel comfortable in my neighborhood because I'm surrounded by more and more people who don't look like me, or talk like me, or live like me. So I give these other arguments instead. But according to Kaufman and Stenner, that's really what's going on. And there's evidence to support this. Now, let's talk about where Kaufman differs from Stenner, or has something distinctive to say. And there are lots of points, but I want to focus on two key points. One about how he diagnoses this problem, and one about how he sees the solution playing out. Kaufman's view is that an important driving factor in the opposition to immigration in Western democracies is a distinctive type of white ethnic cultural conservatism. People, mostly but not exclusively whites, wanting to stop or slow down changes in the ethnic composition of Western countries to preserve white majorities and their central position in the culture of these countries. Now, this contrasts with Stenner in the sense that she's mostly interested in the authoritarian response in democratic societies and its resistance to increasing diversity. Kaufman is pointing to a distinctive conservative response arising from the social change being experienced by whites, namely the threatened loss of their majority status and the threatened loss of a distinctive cultural identity that is associated with white majority cultures in the West. This is why he calls it ethnic cultural conservatism. It has an ethnic component and a cultural component. And this ethnocultural change is occurring at a rapid rate at precisely the time that the dominant liberal ideology celebrates a multicultural vision of ever-increasing diversity. So it's like two storm fronts colliding. This, for Kaufman, is the root cause of the rise of right-wing populism in recent years. Increasing diversity and an ideology that promotes increasing diversity triggers the authoritarian response, the Stenner response, if you want to call it that. At the same time, 
rising immigration in white majority countries is triggering a distinctive conservative response within white populations and within non-white populations that happen to identify with the culture associated with the white majority countries in the West. We can think of this as the Kaufman response. So there's both a standard response and a Kaufman response at work in our contemporary situation. Now I want to talk about how Kaufman sees this situation playing out in the long run and what we can do to help make it as painless as possible. Kaufman argues that the demographic shifts that threaten white majority populations in Western democracies are largely inevitable. Demographic processes depend on variables like birth rates and death rates and intermarriage rates and global geopolitical factors that are are difficult to control. So that the prediction is that the shift from white majority to mixed race majority populations is likely to take place in all but the most remote locations in the West even if immigration levels are drastically reduced. Lowering immigration levels can slow down the rate of racial mixing, but it won't prevent the shift from occurring. So the demographic trend data suggests that, in a century, mixed-race peoples will be the largest group in Britain and America. In two centuries, few people living in urban areas of the West will have an unmixed racial background and most of those who do will be immigrants or members of exclusionary religious groups like ultra-Orthodox Jews. So this is one of the meanings of the term white shift, the demographic transition from white majority to mixed race majority populations. But Kaufman also uses this term in another sense, and one that is actually more the focus of his book. Kaufman argues that one of the historical ways that white majorities have responded to increasing immigration levels is by absorbing people of different ethnicities through intermarriage and by, over time, expanding the category of whiteness to include these new people, resulting in a population that is ethnically mixed by former standards, but that largely sees itself as white and that identifies with white cultural markers. So this is another distinctive sense of the term white shift. It's a shift within a culture about what it means to be white and who is eligible to be included within the category. So this is ultimately the direction that Kaufman thinks we're heading. And he thinks it's a story with a positive end, even if the transition is likely to be painful. But to get the point, I think it'll be helpful to elaborate a bit more on what he means when he talks about expanding the category of whiteness. You can see examples of this in American history where the ethnic identity of the country was organized around a narrative that connected the Protestant settlers of America with the Anglo-Saxon tribes of Europe who had fled the persecution of British Norman rule. This is where the Anglo-Saxon comes from in the term WASP, which stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Many founders considered Americans a distinct ethnic group who were actual descendants of the early medieval Anglo-Saxons. Here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson writing to John Adams, describing the Americans as, quote, the children of Israel in the wilderness, led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and on the other side, Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon chiefs from whom we claim the honor of being descended, and whose political principles and form of government we have assumed, unquote. This is a striking claim, given that Hengist and Horsa were Anglo-Saxon kings of Germanic and Scandinavian pagan tribes who conquered Britain in the 5th century AD. The Anglo-Saxon kingdoms ruled England for the next 600 years until William of Normandy defeated them at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 AD, which inaugurated the era of Norman rule, which ultimately grew into the British monarchy and the British Empire. So the Americans, hundreds of years later, saw themselves as Europeans of English descent resisting British tyranny and sought to claim a historical ethnic identity with the Anglo-Saxon tribes that also fought against British tyranny. So the concept of American political nationhood was constructed around an ethnic core that claimed a connection to ancestors, the Anglo-Saxon tribes of old Europe, and an aspect that defines an ethnic boundary at a given point in time. Ethnic boundaries are typically marked by differences in some combination of language, religion, and physical appearance. So in this case, the WASP trinity defines the ethnic boundary, 
To be ethnically American was to be of white appearance, to have an English, British, or Dutch surname, and to practice a Protestant religion. Now, this is just a starting point for the historical analysis of American ethnic identity that Kaufman gives, which charts how this ethnic core and theorizing about American ethnic identity has morphed over time to accommodate the presence of immigrants from other countries, from other ethnicities, races, and religions. A great illustration of how malleable these ethnic boundaries can be is the story of Irish Catholics who immigrated to America in the late 19th century. Though they were white in appearance, they weren't treated as ethnically white by the majority Protestant population. At the time, being Catholic alone was enough to exclude you. But the Irish were also willing to do labor jobs that most Americans didn't want to do, like build canals, and they inspired anti-immigrant resentment. In the popular press, the Irish were depicted as subhuman, they were carriers of disease, they were drawn as lazy, unclean, drunken brawlers who wallowed in crime, they bred like rats. It was even speculated that the Irish were a non-white race that occupied an intermediate place, uh, like a missing link between the superior European whites and the savage African blacks. Irish immigration inspired anti-immigrant laws that gave the U.S. government powers to deport any immigrant and make it harder for immigrants to vote. So one could argue that the Irish in America weren't members of the white ethnic majority. Being of white appearance made you a candidate for admission, but it wasn't automatic. In some sense, you had to earn it. And they did. Over time, the Irish coalesced their political power by assimilating into the cultural mainstream, mostly by taking jobs in the civil service. Police, firefighters, prison guards, prosecutors, judges, and so on. Another factor that helped the Irish was their participation in the Civil War, which tends to bond soldiers to national identities and their presence in the post-Civil War expansion into the American West. In the Western frontier, the ethnic configurations were different. Mexicans and Chinese were the outsiders. Irish and German Catholics were better accepted as part of the ethnic majority. So, examples like this illustrate how it's possible for conceptions of ethnic identity and white ethnic identity to evolve over time. Now, what does this have to do with Kaufman's solution to the polarization and culture war problem? Well, that problem, according to Kaufman, recall, is generated by the collision of two opposing social forces. One is the tendency for liberal democracies to become increasingly diverse and to promote this diversity as intrinsically good and politically mandatory. So in the limit, this multicultural ethic becomes either a universal cosmopolitan ethic, you know, like an I'm a citizen of the world kind of thinking, where there's no room for moral or political values centered on shared ethnicity or national identity, or it becomes a postmodern identity politics that is endlessly fragmenting, and that again has no room to value a shared ethnicity or national identity. Now, this pro-diversity social force is countered by an opposing social force, the conservative and authoritarian reaction that does not value diversity for its own sake, and that attaches value to specific ethnic and national identities and ways of life associated with them. Kaufman believes that the rise of right-wing populist movements in majority white nations is due primarily to the fact that there is currently no space within the institutions of government within these nations to hear and acknowledge and respond to the sincere feelings of insecurity and alienation felt by many members of white majority populations. The current situation is that minority ethnic identities are given a voice and political representation, but majority ethnic identities are not. To raise such issues on behalf of majority ethnic groups is to court charges of bigotry and racism. So the issue is driven to the political fringe and finds expression in populist rhetoric and right-wing political movements that challenge these mainstream liberal institutions rather than work within it. Now, as long as these two social forces are in play and there's no room for a middle path, there's going to be conflict. But Kaufman does see a middle path, at least in principle. He thinks it's possible for white majority cultures to transition to mixed race majority cultures, while still retaining a sense of continuity with a white ethnic identity. 
a view that he calls ethno-traditional nationalism. He expects ethnic boundaries in the West to gradually shift to include the white majority of mixed descent with at least a certain degree of European ancestry and those non-whites who identify with the traditions of European culture. Now, Kaufman has often been accused by people on the left of being an apologist of sorts for white nationalists. And there is a kind of nationalism that he would endorse, but he's also clear that he doesn't endorse the more conventional forms that nationalism has taken in the West. On the one hand, there's a purely civic nationalism that tries to confer a distinctive identity simply to being a citizen of a particular nation. Kaufman's view is that the right-wing version of civic nationalism tends to suppress the interests of ethnic and other minority groups, which won't work, and the left-wing, multicultural version tries to make diversity itself into an ideology, which also doesn't work. And then on the other hand, there's a purely ethnic nationalism, but these forms of nationalism exclude ethnic minorities, so that won't work either. The solution for Kaufman is a more open definition of national identity, one that would allow different communities to construct a national identity from different aspects of the nation. So he's imagining a kind of grassroots, bottom-up construction of different forms of nationalism within different communities, where the symbols of national pride and national identity may be different for different groups and may have different meanings for different groups. So for more liberal or progressive-minded groups, their nationalism might attach to the ideals of multiculturalism. And for other groups, their nationalism might attach to an ethno-traditional conception of nationhood. And both of these could be seen as politically valid, even if there are tensions between them. They would be seen as different voices expressing different conceptions of the concept of nationhood. Kaufman uses the term multivocalism to describe this phenomenon, which he borrows from anthropologist Victor Turner, where people can attach multiple meanings to the same symbol. You can't have the state mandate one particular way of thinking about what it means to be an American or what the national flag stands for. People take an active part in constructing these meanings as they live their lives and participate in society. And people from different ethnic and social cultural backgrounds will construct these meanings differently. Kaufman doesn't view this as multiculturalism because he's not talking about focusing on ethnic or cultural identities, but rather on focusing on what national identity means for people of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. As he says, quote, where multiculturalism draws people's gaze back to a distant homeland, Multivocalism orients them to the nation, albeit viewed through different ethnic lenses. This flexibility maximizes meaning and unity by harnessing the complexity of national identity. Unquote. So, within this multivocal nationalism, Kaufman argues that there must be room for an ethno traditional identity as one of these voices where it's politically acceptable to acknowledge and value white majority ancestry and traditions and symbols. But it's important that this form of nationalism be open to mixed race and non-white populations to identify with. Because in the end, given demographic trends, it will only be mixed race populations who participate in this form of nationalism. And it's okay if these different conceptions of nationhood aren't entirely compatible. Political ideologies have this character, that they're built around political concepts that allow for different conceptions of those concepts. For example, the concept of freedom is central in all branches of liberal democratic thought. But there are lots of different conceptions of what freedom is and what it demands. Libertarians think of political freedom differently from conservatives or progressive liberals. But they all share a commitment to the value of freedom, and that makes them part of a common political tradition. Similarly, Kaufman would like us to think about nationhood as a political concept that allows for different competing conceptions. People can differ about what's good about America or about being an American, but they can at least agree that there's something good and valuable about identifying with this larger political entity. And that is something that we can build on.
So I think this is enough to get a sense of how Eric Kaufman thinks about the root causes of social polarization today. Now getting back to our argument tree picture, you can see how Kaufman and Stanner and Haidt can all be seen as branches of a common root branch. They basically agree on how to define the problem, they agree on what the relevant variables are, and they share a theoretical orientation that takes political and moral psychology very seriously, and the core idea that variation in human nature at the level of individual psychology puts real constraints on the range of viable forms that liberal democracy can take. When I read their books or listen to their interviews, I feel like I'm learning valuable things. I feel like I'm gaining a, a perspective, a way of looking at the problem that I didn't have before. And I hope you share that feeling. But think back now to the epistemological challenge that I sketched earlier. I feel like I'm gaining knowledge. I'm learning more about the causes of polarization. But how much have I learned relative to what there is to learn? Let's grant that I'm only seeing part of the tree. There's more that I don't know, that I haven't been exposed to, but how much more? Is it possible that I'm like the ethics of war guy, who's only familiar with just war arguments, who hasn't ever thought much about the pacifist tradition or the political realist tradition? Is it possible that for all my research and writing over the past couple of years, I'm still only acquainted with a fraction of the collective argument matrix on this topic? I think the answer is, Yes, I think it is possible, and in fact, I think it's very likely. And it's not because I'm stupid or lazy. It's because of the nature of complex social phenomena, which are multifactorial and multiscalar, and because of the nature of disciplinary expertise, which necessarily focuses on a narrower range of factors operating at a narrower range of scales. So when I'm learning from disciplinary experts, I think of it as exploring the argument matrix along a particular branch or sub-branch. Now, that may be enough to put me ahead of 90% of the population in terms of critical insight, but that's still consistent with me only seeing a fraction of the whole tree. The problem is that it's easy to convince yourself that your fraction is the whole tree, or at least most of the tree especially if you're surrounded by people who've never thought critically about the problem, who don't even know there's a tree there. Your knowledge relative to them seems broad and deep. It can seem comprehensive. It can seem authoritative. But the reality is that you're very likely overconfident. Your calibration is off and probably way off. In situations like this, my policy is just to assume that you know far less than you think you do. And this isn't just humility, it's a debiasing strategy. It puts you in the best position to expand your knowledge by motivating you to seek out and explore those branches of the tree that likely exist, but that you're not acquainted with yet. Okay, I think that's enough for this episode. Next episode, I'm going to share two more perspectives on polarization. One with a family resemblance to the ones we've been talking about here, and another that is very different, that is clearly operating on a different branch of the argument matrix. And this will help to flesh out the epistemological thesis that I'm trying to push here about the challenges of understanding complex social phenomena. I'll close with a reminder about the Argument Ninja Dojo. I've got links in the podcast description for this episode that you can see directly on your phone or podcast app. And that will take you to a page with information about signing up to the dojo with one of the discount coupon links. So please take a look at that if you're interested. Thanks again for listening, and I promise you won't have to wait as long for the next episode.